All right, so welcome to the daily stand-up, where Dev and Ops basically have a place to talk. Uh, where should we, uh, and then, well, actually, let me introduce myself. My name is Mel Delgado. I'm a developer advocate at Cisco. I'm Denise Kwan. I am a software engineer and a developer advocate at Cisco. And so the daily stand-up, it's a discussion between Dev and Ops. So in this case, Denise is a developer. She has been her entire career. Most, and almost all my career, I started off as a developer, but then I went into operations what's loosely known as operations. And, and that's just, I've been in the IT world, I've been in SRE, um, so I've just been mostly in the operations world. So this conversation that we have is bringing dev and ops together to talk about the concepts around DevOps. And so the first topic that we wanted to talk about is, well, what is DevOps? And how do you see what DevOps is versus what I see as DevOps? And why don't we just start there? That's a good place to start. You first. Uh, as a developer, I've always thought that DevOps was like a role, like somebody was actually going to be doing this. Um, it's you know in between the two, and they were going to bridge the two, two together. And that was always my understanding of what it was until I joined DevNet and had a better understanding of it. But I'm pretty sure that there's a lot of devs that have the same opinion as me. And so it'll be great to see what your opinion is of it. All right, well, I've, my opinion is that DevOps is a philosophy. And it's a philosophy that involves methodologies, there's rituals behind it. It just outlines just how everything works with the fundamental principles being something like uh, having small units of work that are delivered rather than these large batch sizes, uh, optimizing your flow, uh, your feedback, as well as your um, continuous improvement process. And those are the three categories, which I, of course I have to borrow from, from Gene Kim and Jez Humble, the folks that, that authored a lot of books and have come, coined the term from a long, long time ago. So um, that's, that's, that's where I draw that from. And, and in my experience, that's what I've seen in the organizations. But I never knew what the name was. It, you know, I never really had that name of like, oh, okay, is that a position? Is it a person? Is it a... Well, and that's just well, how I we, we, You can often find the role of DevOps when you yeah. go and search for it. Yeah. So, you know, it's kind of interesting how everybody has a different opinion of what that actually is. Yeah. And, you know, depending on whether you're on the dev side, whether you're on your ops side, or um, I don't know, it, it just seems like there is no true definition of what it is. Yeah, yeah. Well... What's interesting is that now you're seeing uh, that same philosophy, if you will, or in methodologies. You're seeing this now across security. So you see SecOps, you're seeing AIOps, you're seeing all kinds of different things that start to adopt that. And I think that name of DevOps will probably, at some point, sort of dissolve into the ether. Mm -hmm. And then it'll become you know, uh, more about the specialties uh, versus just the general, the general side of it, I guess. So, All right, so on our backlog for today, so in a typical stand-up, this is one of the rituals. You have this stand-up, and then you talk about what is a user story. And from yep. that user story, it typically breaks down into tasks, and then tasks being something that can no longer be decomposed uh, further. So our first user story. We want to talk about whether or not ops or network engineers should be part of the daily scrum. Like, what are the benefits that it would be if they were part of it? Is it going to be too much work? Is it going to be benefit our application if you do bring them over and see from the developer side? Um, in my opinion, as a developer, I think that a lot of the times there are things that we just assume because we live in such a silo of like, okay, we build this application, that's all we care about. And so if we were to bring in the network engineers, the ops folks, we will probably get a better understanding of how our applications is actually going to run on the infrastructure. And that's what the customers actually see, right? So, you know, from a dev perspective, all you're see, all we see is what we assume the customer is doing. But if we put everybody together from end to end, that actually might be more beneficial. But then if you, on the flip side, that's a lot of time and effort. So where do you think would be the balance? Do you think they should be part of the Scrum team? You know, uh, and participating in the standups, um, it has my vote. So in my career, I've done that. And sometimes I feel like I'm not welcome there. It's not my team. What is going on here? Do I really have to like, 
you know, every single morning, have to, I have my own stand-up. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, when I hear the, hey, we're going to do this one thing that is based on some assumptions that perhaps are incomplete, right? At least I can chime in and say, well, you know, okay, so here's my thought real quick. Can we take this offline and whatever? At least have some input so that that way we get that viewpoint from operations. Because it's, it's it's, it, the converse is true as well. Mm -hmm. I know the op side. I know the infrastructure, whether it's the networking, the storage, compute, virtualization, so on and so forth, container orchestration, so on. That's what I've made a career out of. Mm -hmm. But writing applications, that's you. That's yeah, you, that's right? all I mean, me. So that's <laughs> all you, right? So I know that part, right? And I'm, I feel pretty comfortable with going, hey, you know what? Uh, let's rethink that one assumption, right? Or let's at least talk about it because if we do it this way, here's what the likely outcome is going to be. Mm -hmm. So I really feel it's important to have that input. Uh, and also for devs, if they want to go over to the, you know, our stand-ups, sure. I mean, it might be like watching paint dry because it's, <laughs> You know, what, what are we talking about here? But it, the feeling is sometimes mutual. It's like, yeah, you guys are talking all dev, like all, okay. Okay, but when I hear the key words of like, okay, I'm thinking this, based on those assumptions, it's great that we have that conversation. But and that actually brings to a good point. Like from a dev perspective, I didn't know you guys did Agile and Scrum and daily stand-ups. So, you know, obviously there's a commonality between the two and I think the more that we talk to each other, we're finally realizing that we shouldn't be living in these two silos where there's devs and then there's ops. And if we just share our ideas, you know, I, I know for us, we've been doing Agile for quite some time. And I think that if I understand correctly, it's a newer movement for the ops side. And so possibly there's some lessons learned that can be shared and things that can be shared between the two groups. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know what? It brings me up to another user story, um, which I'm glad you brought up. So as developers, one of the things I noticed is that a lot of developers focus on the issue, not the person. So when something goes wrong, right, because let's just face it, all code can have potentially bugs in it, right? So mm -hmm. nothing's perfect. But if you think about it, um, focusing on that culture of safety, right, is, is something really important that we learned in ops. Funny story behind that. We had somebody who had newly joined the team and we had all this development infrastructure just for our devs. So in other words, our devs were using this really large uh, infrastructure that we had set up on-prem. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things he was doing is he was learning our switching environment. And so he accidentally broke a core uh, it's, it's a peer link. Oh, no. He basically unassigned the peer link, and it was at the core, and it went, it cascaded all the way down 20, I don't even know how many switches, and completely took out the entire development environment. So, Well, when, luckily, that was a development environment and not the production environment. Yeah. <laughs> just to think of, like, right? So I remember just as a team leader just going, like, okay, I want to focus on the issue. Let's focus on that. And, of course what changed, right, where, you know, as we're doing the troubleshooting, you know, of course you had to ask the layer eight questions, like what changed in the environment, who did, so, you know, like nobody was answering, nobody kind of knew. When I found the problem, I'm like, aha, okay. I looked at the logs, I'm like, okay, then the person fessed up. <laughs> and then I just said, you know what, let's look at the problem itself, and then mm -hmm. what can we do in the future to, like, if it, is it process, is it, uh, whatever it is, how can we avoid that problem from happening in the future? What I didn't want to do is to say, how can we have Bob not do that in the future? You know, like that's yeah. just brainstorming. That's putting a whole bunch of energy into not having that culture of safety. Because mm -hmm. what we want to do is we want to surface those ideas and we want to address them right away and fix those problems and then do everything we can with the process or whatever that is, that thing is. We want to avoid that in the future. Not the person, the issue. Have you seen that so, in devs, in the dev world? So you said the safety of culture, right? The culture of safety. Culture of safety. I've never heard that term before, so maybe yeah. you could define what that is because that's a foreign term to me as a dev. Yeah, I think, okay, so the culture of safety, in my opinion, is this. As a developer or somebody in operations, do you feel okay with surfacing and shining a light on things that are a problem? Something that's broken. Even if you're the one that broke it, could you objectively say, this was a problem that needs to be fixed and here's a solution or can we all think of a solution? And most importantly, 
what can we do to avoid that from happening again in the future? But you have to have that culture of safety. In other words, it should be okay to do that, and mm -hmm. you shouldn't fear about, you know, the fear of losing your job or not being promoted or, you know, those things really need to be abstracted away so you can okay. focus on the issue. I, this is so, super oversimplified. I know <laughs> that there's a whole bunch more, but hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, in the dev world, um, it doesn't help that in Git, there's called Git blame. I mean... <laughs> It, it's basically completely opposite of what you were saying. Now you have a term. But That's good. All yeah. Right. Um, it doesn't help that we have Git blame. And I think that it's the same concept of like people being afraid that, oops, I checked in something. So there's sometimes a lot of devs that are afraid to check stuff in because in Git especially, your, what every code change that you make, even if it's a, piece of, it's a space, your name's going to be attached to it. And so I think that there is a common problem there and that needs to be fixed because if you don't, then you have that fear of, oh no, it's going to break it. Luckily for devs, we typically have a dev environment and that gets tested and automation tests gets run on it. And so, yeah, it broke, but it's not as a big deal as it may be if somebody broke a network configuration. <laughs> Right, but should it be? You know, I mean, if somebody I mean, broke the network configuration, there's going to be a lot of people that are upset, right? But then do we focus on that person or do we focus on the process, perhaps? How did that change occur? How, you know, do we need to have some sort of, lack of a better term, almost like a linter or something to check <laughs> that configuration for that extra space or in the network well, world? You know, uh, did, did we have somebody who was, uh, reviewing that before it went out, right? Is there sort, you know, almost like a uh, like a like, oh, okay, I issued a pull request in Git. Is there that process, that second set of eyes, or something? In other words, focus on the the process. I don't know. So, well, I mean, remember our colleague Adrian had that whole CI/CD pipeline to be able to test network configuration before it gets pushed to production, and so that's a that is a prime example of how you can actually test. And of course, at the end of the day, there's always going to be something that slips by you. But hopefully, if you implement some stuff that can actually, that process to prevent all of this, then at least whoever actually does end up making a mistake um, wouldn't, wouldn't feel as bad. Because yeah. typically, if you did it, even though you know it's you, you feel horrible anyways. And we've all been there. I've pushed some code that you know, you test it, but you were, it was probably late at night and you didn't fully test it. You tested your piece and it happens to everybody. And um, I think that that's actually something common between the two that needs to be worked on and, you know, not have that blame game. Right, right. Well, and, and to your point, like you said, like one of the things in their process that you were just talking about is that perhaps there's automated unit tests, mm -hmm. right? Um, maybe it's right when you uh, commit Right, and then you issue a pull request, you kick off a test, and then you don't merge that pull request unless that test pass yep. passes, right? And that's so, typically how we do things in the dev right. side, but like I said, things slip through the cracks. Yeah, and so, I mean, mistakes. it happens. They're mistakes. It happens. We're human. We're human. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's layer eight. Uh, and so, can you automate your way out of that? So, I think today in, net in the network world, we saw that some of the presentations I saw to automate that. Mm -hmm. um, I thought were very compelling and engaging here at Cisco Live. That was, I thought, very interesting because we have that. And it, you know, you might be asking, well, why is that? Well, sure, we want to automate. Sure, we want to be more efficient. But at the same time, we also want to uh, foster that that uh, culture of safety where you could do that and you know focus on that problem uh, itself, not the person. Yeah. So I think. User stories. Okay, so that covers our two user stories for our session today. Mm -hmm. Are there any user stories that you would want to learn about? In other words, between dev and ops, you have questions. Are you an ops person? Are you a dev? Would you like to know more about ops? I know that this is being live streamed, so oh, yes, that's right. you know we can't see the comments, but put it in the comments. And because we do have a YouTube series that is on the Cisco DevNet channel, and you can, we will take a look at these comments and integrate it into our YouTube series. Yeah, and we'll do some research if we don't have the experiences behind it. Or bring or in guests. You know what? I think that would be a lot more fun than just doing the research and saying, okay, you know, like, this yeah, is what we, we have think. plenty of people on our team that yeah. will probably know. Or, you know what? Maybe even bring those people in, 
from mm -hmm. home remotely, yeah. they could be that guest speaker. So yep. uh, yeah, so add it in the comments and our YouTube channel. And so, yeah. Yeah, add it to the comments and we'd love to hear from you. Thanks for watching. Thank you.